Welcome to a new episode of SCAP e-learning series on public-private partnership. In this module will provide answers to questions like what are the main options for financing a PP project? And what are the key contractual relationships? We will also provide a basic overview of methods to assess PPP project financing costs and overall profitability. Let's start with finance. What are the alternatives for financing PPP infrastructure projects? One option is corporate finance. With this approach, a party wishing to undertake an infrastructure project borrows money from the bank. Upon project completion, the borrower uses revenue generated from the new infrastructure to repay the loan. If project revenues are not sufficient, the borrower must rely on its other business activities to compensate for the shortfall and pay back the lender. However, this other source of revenue might also fall short of meeting the financial obligation. This is because the amount at stake in infrastructure projects are typically large by nature. So if the project fails, the whole company might be at risk. Is there an alternative? Project finance is a second option that was developed to provide an alternative solution to the financial risk exposure involved in corporate finance. Rather than borrowing directly capital, with project finance, a party wishing to realize an infrastructure project establishes a dedicated project company known as a Special Purpose Vehicle, or SPV, to acquire financing and implement project activities. This legally isolates the parent organization from direct exposure to the financial risk associated with the project. This also means that the lender can only rely on the project revenues for securing loans, which entails a higher degree of risk for them, resulting in increased scrutiny. Project finance is typically the solution preferred for PPPs. In this project sector, the majority of contractual relationships are with the project company, the most important of which is the PPP contract signed between the government entity and the project company. To implement the project, the project company will further subcontract project activities to other firms. For example, project construction is typically subcontract to an engineering, procurement and construction, or EPC contractor, and operation and maintenance is likewise assigned to an OEM contractor. Organizations establishing the project company have also to agree on their rights and responsibilities regarding the project company through shareholder agreements. This project company subsequently acquires project financing through loan agreements. Financing a project in this way typically involves both equity and debt, which are the next two topics the presentation address. Equity contributors provide the initial capital of the project company and subsequently own equity share in the infrastructure asset. These equity contributors are typically a consortium of companies involved in the project, such as project developers and construction firms. Institutional investors, like insurance companies, may also invest in the equity of a project. Being an equity provider means that you are the first one to put your money in the project, but the last one to take it out. But what does this really mean? A parallel can be made with financing arrangement for buying a personal property. In order to purchase a home price at 100, an individual might invest 20 from her personal savings and borrow funds to cover the outstanding balance from a bank. If the individual were to sell the home a year down the line at a lower amount of 90, the lending bank would be reimbursed before the individual could claim any of the sale revenue. The same dynamic is at play with project finance lenders are entitled to financial recourse before equity contributors can claim any returns or repayment. Because equity contributors bear the highest risk, they correspondingly stand to receive the highest potential return. Now let's consider the subject of debt financing. Debt is typically issued to PPP by a project by commercial banks, international finance institutions like the World Bank Group, or export credit agencies. Interest is calculated based on the level of risk involved in a particular project. Less risky projects will enjoy lower borrowing costs when seeking finance. If a project poses too much financial risk, it may not be able to obtain any financing at all. An issue with bank financing is that banks can rarely grant loans for the kind of 20-year spans required for a PPP project. Bank loans typically reach maturity before the contract term after 5-10 years, depending on the market condition. This kind of maturity mismatch necessitated that the project be refinanced, with the added risk of lack of financing availability. Refinancing is not only a risk, it can also be an opportunity. Refinancing usually takes place after the conclusion of the construction phase when the risk is reduced, thereby creating an opportunity to obtain relatively decreased cost of borrowing. Now that we have seen the main source of financing, the question is how much does it cost to finance a PPP project? 
The overall financing cost of a BB project is often the result of a combination of risk, cost, and bankability factors. An important concept related to this is leverage, which is the ratio of debt to equity. Let's take an example. If a project is financed with 25% equity and 75% debt, it features a leverage of 3 to 1, $3 of debt for $1 of equity. But what is the financing cost of the project? To determine this cost, we use a simplified version of the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC. If equity providers seek returns of 15% and lenders charge 5% interest, the WAC is 25%, the share of equity, times 15%, the cost of equity, plus 75%, the share of debt, times 5%, the cost of debt. This gives an average cost of capital of 7.5%. Because equity providers request higher rates of return to compensate for higher investment risk, if the share of equity in the project is reduced, the work will be reduced accordingly. For example, the equity share is reduced to 20%, thereby increasing leverage to 4 to 1, work calculation revealed that the average cost is decreased to 7%. Investors seek to limit the equity as much as possible because more debt means more lower financing costs. However, an increased debt to equity ratio increased financial risk due to the limited supply of equity to absorb losses in case of project difficulties. This is why governments typically prefer projects with reasonable leverage ratios. The detailed analysis of private financing shows that the financing cost of PV projects is likely to be higher than traditional infrastructure projects financed through public debt. In our example, the cost of public debt should typically be less than 5% as the public debt is considered as less risky than private loan. For a PV project to make sense, these additional financing costs need to be offset by, offset by efficiency gains or other advantages resulting from the PVP approach. That concludes the part of the module on the cost of financing of a PV project, of which WAC is a key indicator. We can now have a look to another important consideration of a PV project, which is project profitability. Let's first consider the source of revenues. Projects generate cash because services are provided to end user. For providing these services, project companies are paid either by the end user or by the government. To determine profitability, a projection of revenue generated throughout the life of a project is compared to the estimated cost over the same span. Contrasting revenues with costs allow for the calculation of cash flow projection. Typically, cash flow are negative during the construction of a project and then become positive. The projects are complex and a comprehensive financial model is required to produce accurate projections. A financial model is a spreadsheet where the projection in terms of cost and revenues are gathered together with some key assumptions. The model then can produce cash flow projection as well as indicator of profitability like the internal rate of return or IAR. The IAR is used to measure the profitability of an investment. Even an IAR of 8% is equivalent to investing 100 into an asset and selling it one year later for 108 with a profit of 8 in a one-year period. Comprehensive IR calculation for multi-year periods can get fairly complex, but they rely on the same basic principle. The reliability of a project indicator, of a profit indicator, depends upon the quality of projection. Modified assumption and correspondingly modified cash flow projections will produce different values for the projection of profit. In our example, by increasing the cash flow in year 2 from 30 to 40, the IRR increased to 12%. To summarize, the IRR is an indicator of profitability, and a project becomes increasingly attractive as the projected profitability is expanded beyond the cost of financing, which can be estimated by the WAC. That concludes our overview of PPP structure and financing model. We hope you have enjoyed the presentation. As always, more information and additional resources on PVP are available on our website at www.unscap.org. Thank you very much.